<laughs> welcome everyone. I do want to um, welcome everybody who's come to, to join us and apologize in advance just because I am a little bit um, not fully um, present physically and it's had it, it's sort of making me a little loopy. Um, so I, if I don't sound completely coherent, I, I know I'm not very coherent right now. But again, I'm very, very pleased to welcome uh, Justine Villanueva for um, today's uh, presentation. So let me just go ahead and launch in and introduce you all to Justine. So Justine Villanueva is an immigrant residing in the unceded Patwin, um, Wintun territory in what is called Davis, California. She traces her ancestral roots to Bukidnon, Philippines. Justine writes adult fiction and nonfiction, particularly regarding the experiences of Filipinos in the United States. She often uses Filipino folklore, indigenous worldview, and relationships with the land as foundations for her storytelling. She also writes children's stories. Of course, that's what we're going to be talking about today, and strongly believes in the need for those that tell of the Filipino American children's experiences in the diaspora. Her writing is her contribution to our collective effort to being guided by Filipino indigenous worldview and the tradition of the Babaylan, um, the indigenous healers. She holds, um, she holds her role as an attorney to be that of a counselor whose sacred goal is to help her kapwa. So she is actually kind of a, an attorney by training, but she holds her role as an attorney to be that of a counselor which is great, whose sacred goal is to help her kapwa, her fellow beings, not only deal with their legal issues, but also strive for, toward belonging, wholeness, and well-being. And as uh, you all know, today's uh, discussion is on the topic, decolonizing children's book publishing, publishing for, by, and of the people. And again, thank you, Justine. I can't think of anybody else who is most appropriate, um, the more, a more appropriate inaugural speaker for at least the, the School for Liberating Education. Of course, Bolosan has been doing lots of great work with you already, but you're just so perfect uh, for this new initiative. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us. And I'll pass it on to you. Thank you. Dr. Rodriguez, thank you, Bulasan Center, for having me today to talk about decolonizing children's book publishing um, to kickstart the year 2022 and the um, School for Liberating Education uh, curriculum. I am very honored and happy to be here. I would like to just start at first with a land acknowledgement. I am using a uh, land acknowledgement that has been approved by the Yochadihi Tribal Council and it's recommended for use by UC Davis. And since I'm also a resident of Davis, I felt that this is the appropriate land acknowledgement to use for this gathering. I'm just going to read it. We should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we gather. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Patwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Patwin tribes, Kachil Dihi Band of Winton Indians of the Kalusa Indian community, Fletzel Dihi Winton Nation, and Yocha Dihi Winton Nation. The Patwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. Um, I also just want to mention briefly, I think. Angela added on the chat uh, resources for land acknowledgements in case you are interested in looking into um, the, the resources for where you are, where you're located at. Okay, so um, I'm going to start about me and why I write and publish children's books. Dr. Rodriguez has given a bio, um, so I won't go too much into it. But I do want to just acknowledge briefly again the land where I am from. I am from Bukidnon, Philippines. And um, I also want to just acknowledge my ancestral lineage, which is Bulacan from my maternal grandparents and uh, my paternal, I'm sorry, my paternal grandparents from Cebu and then Bukidnon. All right, so why I write? I've been writing forever, I feel like, but I really started writing with more intentionality when I became a mother uh, a few years back, not a few years, uh, 13 years ago. And um, I became a ginikanan, which is in Bisaya, the word for um, a parent or 
where you're from. Um, when I became a mom, I became very conscious of my part in the ancestral lineage. And I became concerned about my parental responsibility to take stock of what has been passed on to me by my ancestors and what then I could pass on to my kids or not, depending on whether it's you know, life affirming or not life affirming. And so I also write um, as part or as a deepening of my personal decolonization journey. Um, when I, so decolonizing is such a big word. And so I'm going to just say that when, what I mean personally by that is just healing from the harms of the colonization of our people's, Filipino people's minds and land and ways of being. And so when I try to decolonize, I try to be whole, I try to heal from these wounds and writing is the way I do it. And by extension, publishing is um, my deepening of this personal decolonization journey. So um, I'm going to very briefly talk about the Sawaga River Press, which is my press. I founded this back in 2015. And this was um, the time when I had my kids and they were younger and I was looking for books to read to them. And I couldn't find, um, well, I did find very, very few books that had um, Filipino American protagonists and also Filipino American content. Um, and so I decided then to make my own because why can't I? You know, I took out my cardboard and my Sharpie and made my own books in Bisaya and um, uh, featuring brown kids. Um, so what started out as a personal project became a cause as I learned more about the dire need for books that featured our kids. There weren't many of them. And so I founded Sawaga River Press. Sawaga River is the river from my childhood. Uh, it's a river that runs through Malay Balai Bukidnon, which is where I'm from. Um, as a press, we publish multi uh, multilingual children's books that center Filipino kids in the diaspora. And we value indigenous wisdom and spirituality, inclusion, diversity, equity, and the right to self-represent. So, um, that is our main, that's our values. But we also do classroom readings. So if you're a, an educator from kindergarten through university level, please do invite us to your classes. And we provide guidance for new and um, aspiring authors or publishers. So I'm happy to share what, what we have learned in our uh, publishing journey so far. Very briefly, just to kind of see what we have done. This is our first book, Mama, Mama, Do You Know What I Like? It's, um, it's a trilingual book. It's in Bisaya, again, the, my, mother, my, my mother tongue, English and uh, Filipino, Filipino national language. Um, if you were interested in following us or uh, learning what we learned through the process of publishing this book, you can go to mamamama.net. This was back in 2017. And this is just a peek into the joyful life of a five-year-old Charlie who tells his mama the things that he likes. And it's um, got a lot of references to what a Filipino um, child might experience as part of his daily life. Second book is Jack and Agio. This was in 2019. This talks about uh, a child who loves to read and who couldn't find himself in the books that he reads. And so he goes out there and tries to fix this wrong and he colors the books brown because that's his favorite color, his brown skin gets in trouble and um, his mama tells him stories um, based from the Filipino epics where the characters do look like him. And um, this book uh, won a couple of awards in 2020. Again, this is, uh, this is not only trilingual, this is also in it's in four languages, um, also in Binukid, which is the indigenous language of uh, Bukidnon. And this is our third book, Mungan and Her Lola. It's coming out in 2022. And that's our website if you're interested in following us. It's about a child who uh, engages in Filipino rituals of care to help her Lola feel better. Um, touches on oral histories, mental well-being, and um, 
just our, our creative arts that are important in the process of healing ourselves from the wounds of colonization. All right, so that's us and Sawaga River Press. I want to talk uh, the rest of my time here about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in traditional publishing. So very briefly, just when I say traditional publishing, it just means that it's a, it's publishing through a press and um, the press owns the rights to the work of the authors and illustrators and they in exchange pay advances and royalties for the, for the use of those um, intellectual property. And um, there's probably four really big presses out there that dominate the whole scene. I don't know how many presses there are, but there's four huge uh, dominating uh, presses that really kind of control the publishing industry. And then you have the independent publishing, which is independent. You kind of own the whole process of creation from A to Z. You own your rights and you do everything. I wanted to show very briefly here the, uh, the data on the publishing professionals from 2019, as you can see. There is, um, it is predominantly white, predominantly cis woman, 74%, 76 here, straight, and 89% with no disability. Um, and if you're interested in where we might be as Filipinos, uh, here right here is 7% Asian. So if you further break that down, I don't know what that number is, but I'm guessing very, very uh, small portion of that 7%. So challenges in the profession, obviously, there's low salary, which is why a lot of people who do work in the field come from families that have money or they're independently wealthy or they have spouses that can support them. Um, it's not, it's a barrier for a lot of POC professionals who might come from immigrant backgrounds. You know, we have Filipino parents who like not just to become doctors and attorneys or nurses so we can help support you know, not just our family, immediate family, but the whole community. And so it's hard to do that on a low salary. Um, so what does that mean? We have gatekeepers that are primarily of this group right here. And these gatekeepers get to decide what kinds of books to, to make and where to sell. And just to sum it all up, you could say that it really does center white readers and it centers um, white sensibilities. And for us, the ethnic market, the niche markets, uh, we are the other markets and um, we don't get a lot of our books because there's the myth that we don't buy books. Um, probably we don't buy books at the bookstores. Maybe we buy them somewhere else, but there's a myth that we don't buy books. And so books about us are not published and then it kind of feeds into this loop. Um, Another challenge in the profession is a scarcity mentality, which is that they think that only one or few POC authors can be published at the same time. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if a Filipino writer has already been published this year, too bad, that's the slot you are like, you might have to wait your turn a few more years down the road because the slot's been taken. Um, and also there's the, um, the, the challenge of so-called quality. If, if a story or is not, if a story does not comport with um, the, the traditional storytelling way, or it's not familiar to the gatekeepers, then it might not be deemed good enough and then it won't be published. So I feel like some of these challenges are probably very familiar to most of you here. Um, a little bit of data on the main characters here. Um, you see 41% white, 29% animals, put them together. That's pretty much 30% of um, the representation of, of the characters. Here we are, Asian, 9%. Again, further breaking it down to Filipinos. I don't know what the number is, but we probably are in the 0.00, .00 uh, figure. Um, right here, you can see point one five for indigenous and then 0 0.00 something for Arab. It's, it's kind of, um, I can't really see, 0 0.001 for Pacific Islander. So it's very, um, very dismal. Um, here, I'm gonna go back to this really quickly, but I'm gonna move forward here because I wanna talk about 
the issues and the challenges in the book creation. So again, we, this has been discussed a lot, the lack of representation, books as mirrors. We don't have them. And in fact, Jack and Agu tackles that topic um, of POC kids not seeing themselves in the books that they read. And um, here we kind of have the erasure and appropriation. And this is kind of, this is related to the data here that I wanted to show. Um, brings the question of who gets to talk about our stories, who gets to write about our stories. Yes, for example, here in the under in here in the Black African data, 252 books by uh, Black authors and illustrators, and yet 400 books about Black African kids. And so it begs the question of who you know who's writing the stories about Black kids that are not Black themselves. And how is that okay? And how do we make sure that representation is accurate? Who gets to make money out of writing this, our stories? Um, so all those things are kind of um, challenges that we need to think about. Um, I get right here, I'm bringing up own voices, which is kind of what I was talking about. And the question of authenticity, because once you have a small pool of what it means to be something, what it means to be Filipino, for example, that's what's authentic. And if we go beyond it, then you're not authentic because really the, there's no, there is no diversity in, in our ways of being. There's only one or two or three um, ways and um, beyond it, it's, it's not authentic anymore. Um, so those are some of the questions that are that some of the challenges in, in the book creation and content brought about by the lack of diversity. So the question that I ask myself, I have been asking myself is, is diversity in traditional publishing the answer? So there's a lot of you know, diversity initiatives to get more people, more, more writers, more, more creators, and more people in the profession, more executives, more editors, more in the sales, more interns. You know, there's more, more diversity um, that's encouraged. Um, but I, and I'm not knocking those. So, you know, the, the, the call for diversity has been ongoing for a long, long time. Personally, I've read articles from the 60s talking about the same problem. And yet here we are, you know, 2020, and we're still talking about the same thing. And the consensus is that there's really not much progress that has been made, even though there has been progress made. Um, so I, I, that's why I kind of bring the, the whole thing of, of considering these two things, which is that publishing actually, at least in the context of our people, um, is, is a tool for cultural imperialism, you know, that the books and education, publication of the books and education are, um, was the way in which our minds was subjugated. You know, the, it was through our books that we lost our languages. It was through books that we learned other ways, other ways, not our own, and we became enamored with it. So it is through books, through publishing, that we really have been um, subjugated. So publishing is a tool for cultural imperialism, and it's rooted in white supremacy. And then also consider that publishing is a capitalist venture. Um, I've heard this told to me many times in conferences and even as advice to like not take it personally because in the end, the book publishing industry is a business and it is in the business of making and selling and profiting from selling books. That's what it is. And so don't take it personally if you don't, you know, if you don't get in, don't take it personally. You, It's not a knock on the the quality of your work, supposedly. It's just a business and they have to make money and this is what it means to make money. And so it is really driven by profit. And so if you put these things together that it is a tool for cultural imperialism and that it is a capitalist venture, then diversity and equity really are anomalies. You know, That's not what the system is made for. It's not the norm. And so really the system is not broken. It's not doesn't need to be fixed because it's functioning for the purpose that it was made for. Um, and there is a danger, at least that way I see it, it's like POCs who make it despite the odds against them are in a way tokenized and used also to legitimize this imperialist and capitalist system. And so I, I feel that there's a danger for that. And is, there's a danger in that. 
Um, but I don't want to knock the traditional publishing. Instead, I want to talk about alternatives. Um, beyond diversity in traditional publishing, we can decolonize. And what does that mean when we say we decolonize publishing? And really, for me, to put it in simple terms, and again, even though I don't want to simplify it because it's a very complicated topic, what I mean when I say decolonizing uh, publishing is really just to center ourselves and to decenter away from whiteness. Um, so for us, it means publishing for our community, of our community, and about our community. And for this to happen, we need to create our independent infrastructures and means of production. Infrastructure that we own ourselves, that's not controlled by other people, um, that's not according to other people's agendas. And we need to make this commercial success so that people who want to be in publishing can actually engage in publishing and make a sustainable way of living out of it instead of being poor and being in publishing because you know that's that's no fun. Um, so very briefly what does it mean to be publishing for our community? Um, it means that we identify for whom we write and publish. I'm very clear that I write for the Filipino and uh, Filipino community. And when I say that, I don't, I mean it as an empowering, uh, an empowering goal as opposed to being exclusionary. So when I identify that I'm, when I have identified the community as, as the readers as, as for whom I'm writing and publishing, then I know how, I, I know how to go and sell my books. I don't go to, you know, like the big stores, because in fact, most people who buy my books are people who buy them at Filipino events. You know, all these events where Filipinos actually go and discover things. So knowing who we're writing for and we're publishing for uh, affect how we market our books. And so um, anyway, so, so that's clear to me. And then also when we know that we are writing for our Filipino community, we are more motivated to get to know our community and we create relationships with the community because we are writing for them. And so there is, you know, like, a, a, there's a, my hands, I can't see my hands. <laughs> um, anyway, there's a relationship there and that makes it, that makes it worthwhile. Um, publishing by the community. I'm really all about this, the publishing by the community. I want, to collaborate and engage as many people in the community as I can in as many aspects of the publishing as, as possible. So for us, for example, in all our three books, we have crowdfunded our books. And every time I go out there and ask for, for the community to fund our books, there has been such tremendous support, which is how I know that our community really want this. They really want, and they really want to support this book. And it kind of gives, people gives them uh, a chance to kind of put where their money is, like put, put the money where their values are, right? So this is kind of a, uh, a way to consume outside of the capitalist system, but it's also a way to kind of just register that yes, you know, through crowdfunding, I am going to support uh, your publication because those books will also benefit me. So I'm a big proponent of crowdfunding, um, even though I, I started back in the day feeling really weird and bad about asking for money because there's such a taboo about money. Anyway, so I wanted to get that out. And then also just like creating relationships with the community. For example, I have worked with the Bulusan Center for Filipino Studies in the creation of Jack and Ague. I have also... Um, uh, collaborated with the Center for Babaylan Studies, um, the Bukidnon Studies Center, um, the Pinay Powerhouse Collective for a new reader that's coming up. Anyway, so there's an opportunity to create relationships with the community that just makes this process of publishing stronger and just even, even more intentional and more gratifying. Uh, this also includes hiring creators and professionals from the community. Uh, there's not a lot, I think there's not a lot of opportunities for, for artists out there to create, to create things. And so to be able to hire from our community is also, is also a big thing for me. 
Okay, so, and then lastly, we get to talk about, we get to publish about our community, um, our oral histories, our struggles, our joys, our contributions, our myths, and we center our diverse and beautiful ways of being, whatever that looks like to us. Uh, and then the big thing for me too is that there's no need to explain or to translate or to legitimize ourselves because we already know who we're writing for mainly and it's we're writing for ourselves. Um, and this is a big thing for me. I hate, I, <laughs> I'm not gonna go into it, but translating is such a, ugh. anyway, um, I'll leave it at that. So my last words really is just to write your stories, just keep at it. If you can publish your stories and if you can publish other people's stories. Um, and then last, last words, the work to decolonize publishing as well as other things is really multi-layered and there's space for you to do the work, whether it's independent through the independent um, way or even through traditional publishing. Um, you just start where you are and you do your part one thing or one day at a time and um, and then please have fun. And that I think is my whole spiel. Connect with us, sawagariverpress.com. That's our email. Thank you. And I'm really, I mean, I can't say this enough. I'm really um, happy to share what I have so far learned. I mean, I'm not like the expert on everything and everything, but I'm happy to share what I've learned so far because I know how it felt like when I was still starting and not knowing who to go because there are very few in our community who are engaging in publishing. So there you go. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Christine. This is so, so wonderful. You could see that there's just a lot of affirmation and there were a couple that just the applause, the applause <laughs> um, by people who were able to attend uh, with us in real time. But, um, you know, I really, really appreciate what you had to say about decolonizing publishing because I think, and, and again, why I feel like you um are uh, just the, the best person to kind of kick off um, kind of this lecture series that's partially hosted by this School for Liberating Education because really that's what we're trying to do um, with the School for Liberating Education. I mean, the, the, if people are familiar with the Belusan uh, Center story, in many ways, you know, I think that was our attempt to try to, um, and it was successful to some extent, to decolonize the university in, mm -hmm. in a certain kind of way, right? Using some of the very tools uh, that the very powerful use to carve out um, a space in the university to ensure that research and knowledge advances, um, you know, the interests of uh, corporate interests, for example, um, that's, you know, there's a reason why, for instance, you know, buildings on a campus are named after, you know, certain kinds of industrialists or corporate um, or even, you know, might actually have the, the names of businesses on, on uh, uh, you know, is, is because of the ways that uh, the university is responsive to, um, to donor money, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so we wanted to kind of use some of those very mechanisms, but then to, to pry open a space for Philippine studies. And so it's been great. It's been a great ride in the Belusan Center, but it also has meant that we have to deal with a lot of uh, constraints mm -hmm. on the part of the university. I mean, for all intents and purposes, we are not a UC Davis Center. We're only at UC Davis um, mm. only because I happen to be there and because um, it's sort of a holding space. Um, but, you know, part of this initiative around the School for Liberating Education is, yes, what would it look like to actually completely take this knowledge that we know can be so liberating for our communities and not have it, um, you know, all the barriers to that knowledge um, be imposed, right? Admissions processes and all of that. Um, so anyhow, I just feel like there's so much alignment between kind of uh, your, you know, the work that you do and the work that I think I've been trying to do in the context of Belusan and now in this newer kind of space. But, you know, I, I really appreciated what you had to say, just the breakdown of the industry. You know, I, I have a younger child um, who is, you know, starting to read and it was just a funny story. Um, we picked up a book that, you know, had Asian characters. And I just remember how um, he was, couldn't understand um, why the facial expressions were drawn in a certain kind of way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because basically, you know, they try to like draw basically slant eyes, right? In the mm -hmm. representations of Asians, right? And um, <clears throat> it was sort of interesting to see how he 
was processing it because he's like, mama, why do they look so angry? Because the person was like, oh, look, look at this book. It has Asians. Uh And he's like, and we're Asian. Isn't that great? And he's like, but mama, how come? How come the eyes look like they're so mad? Why are they so <laughs> angry? So just kind of a funny story, but also just the real kind of struggles we deal with as parents to try to find and source, um, you know, books um, that don't just merely represent our experiences in a very flat and superficial way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, meaning it's not, a you know, that discrepancy between the about, right? Books mm-hmm. about versus books by is mm-hmm. really- huge um yeah yeah yeah. um how about I mean I'd love to just uh hear uh open it up to just the the folks who are in the room I I know that there are a bunch of uh, parents in the space here who are probably also very very interested in trying to um you know support their their young readers and giving you know their children um you know opportunities to see themselves in books anybody have questions or comments that they want to raise while we have uh justine here with us i'll give it time some time but definitely put um uh any of your questions or comments in the chat you know one thing i'd like to hear from you justine is one thing that i love is that you are also very connected to networks of other kind of bipoc right black indigenous people of color um publishers and Mm -hmm. authors um do you maybe maybe can, can you share some resources that you look to as or that you've looked to as a parent but also as a publisher and creator that you might want to share with some of us if for those of us who are still trying to kind of compile our lists of good places to look. Are you talking about um, publishing, if you were considering publishing or? I or... think both, but both, maybe both as a parent trying to look for um, mm-hmm. other sources of, mm-hmm. um, you know, stories, but also what it might, uh, you know, what it takes to self-publish. So when I, so when I first started back in, I don't know what, 20 something, 2014 or something like that. I started out with, with almost zero. Like I did work for a year at a publishing company right after graduation, right after college, but that was nothing related to children's books or anything like that. Um, So I really was starting from kind of nothing. And I just was lucky to find I was lucky to have a friend who knew someone who knew someone who at that time was also kickstarting her book. And I talked to her and she has helped me. She helped me with, with basically like what she knew. She used to work for children's book press. And so from that very little, um, from that start, I, I just kept going and going and going in little, little, um, little increments. Um, and I have been kind of finding myself involved in uh, the Bay. It's in the Bay Area um, group of independent publishers. Uh, we call ourselves the Fight Club. Maybe I shouldn't mention that we're the Fight Club. Isn't that the role or something like that? I don't know. Anyway, so it's like a it's a group of um, independent publishers of color that just really banded together and kind of formed a collective of sorts and tried to share information about you know, how to do Kickstarters or who's your printer or, you know, just just things like how do you get an ISBN? How do you get the, the Library of Congress to do these things? So like little things that I would not have known how to do or would have had so much, so much time learning on my own, I managed to just kind of learn from, um, from this collective. And so um, that's been very helpful for me. And then I think also just um, within the Philippine American community, I've I've made connections with the uh, other people who are also publishing now, like Sari Sari Books and uh, Gail Roma Santa for um, the Larry Leon book and um, Little Jeepney. There's uh, there's a few um, publishers that are kind of just doing our own little thing and. It's just kind of making our dent <laughs> as much as we can. And so it's it's nice to actually have personal relationships with those people. Like we have the social justice book fair at the end of the year. Now it's on our fifth year. It's nice to see people and know that you have beyond 
virtual relationships that you're actually like friends with these people who kind of value the same things that you do. And so, um, yeah. So if anybody is interested in kind of for, forging or foraying into, into publishing, please, um, my email is there and I'm really happy to connect you, connect you to, with, uh, connect you to other people or other resources that you might, um, might need if I know of them. It, there was a resource that was just shared, um, <clears throat> uh, a social justice book uh, fair by uh, uh, Ricardo Ramirez. Thank you for that. But a couple of questions have come up. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question about um, what you found one, uh, most challenging in doing decolonizing work. Um, that this it's Anna had a professor that once said that we live in this world as we work to fight against it and wanting to know um, uh, how you stay motivated or hopeful whilst uh, we all live in this kind of system and try to do this work. Great question. Thank you. Yeah, that's an awesome question. And the, but I should, I've been thinking a lot about this, like, you know, what's, what so far has been my, my greatest lesson or the thing that has, that, that I've really learned from this and would like, well, I wasn't going to say, I wish I'd known this when I started. Um, but it's really just like having having the confidence or cultivating that confidence in your story because when i first started this i had so many doubts about like whether my story would be appealing to everyone else you know whether my story is good enough like does it follow the usual story of like beginning and beginning middle end you know like so many doubts about the stories that i want to share and over the years i have become better at thinking like if it matters to me it probably matters to someone else out there and i don't have it doesn't have to matter to like the rest of the world you know um, so I think for me, that was my, my greatest lesson. And that's what kind of keeps me going when I start thinking about um, not doing this anymore, or, you know, doing other things, doing other things, not, not, not about sharing stories. Like, it really is just like, I just want to tell a story. And if I don't tell a story, no one else will. And who's to say that my story is not worth telling? I'm going to tell it anyway, because in fact, the stories that we know now are probably from people who, you know, in the years past told their stories. And now we seem to think that their stories are like these stories that need to be known, you know, like whatever. It's, it's, I'm going to just write it. So I think that was my, that I think out of all the lessons that I've learned, and there have been many, and there are many, that I think is fundamental to doing this work because if I don't believe or have confidence in the stories that I'm that I'm sharing then then I'm not going to move forward I, I, I will not have motivation to move forward thank you for that Justine I just yeah. some some more love and affirmation uh Sally's just saying thank you so much for the work that you do um, she's reflecting on, or they're reflecting on growing up and attending um, schools that were all people of color, um, the students, but the books were all white centered, and right? Nothing about um, non-white um, or BIPOC experiences. And eventually how the library was, or funding for the library was actually stopped because of this assumption that the students didn't care about reading, which mm -hmm. is kind of interesting, right? This idea mm -hmm. that... Um, you know, we don't want to read. Maybe we just don't want to read about you. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to read about us. Um, so anyhow, speaking of stories about us, Edgar, hi, Edgar, is, is on and has a question about um, uh, your future book projects. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what do you really want to work on? And I think the other question connected to this and actually, you know, Justine, when we checked in on about uh, checked in about this earlier, we talked about the fact that your own children are growing up and are kind of not aging out, but definitely not necessarily the most ideal audience for the current books you've put out. So what right. are you thinking about? Oh, that is that's a lot of questions, by the way, but. <laughs> But it is true, the whole aging out. I started this when my kids were, you know, this age reading picture books. And that was one of the motivation to do it because I was like, if I have to wait 
for traditional publishers to, you know, give me the blessings, my kids will, you know, be married by them. <laughs> so, um, but yes, but yes, you're right, though. Uh, now that my kids are older, I am starting to think about like, kind of growing with them as far as what stories to tell, because I am paying attention to the things that they're reading. And then also just thinking, oh, that would be a cool story for middle-aged, I mean, middle-aged, middle-grade kids. Um, so I, I kind of have started thinking um, of um, growing with them, with the work. Um, and, and I think that's, that's, I think that's how it should be because the, my writing is kind of a reflection of my life. Um, but uh, what, I'm, what I'm really excited about since Edgar asked about this third book that's coming out, this is my, this is me. This is my book right here because, you know, the first two books I wrote, well, the first book I wrote because, you know, it was my kid. It was my little five-year-old boy. And then the second book was like, well, I have to have parody because I have two boys. You know, I don't want to have my second child going, mama, you didn't write a book for me. So I'm like, I got to write another book. <laughs> and then now that I'm done, I'm not writing about my, my dog now, but now I'm done. I'm like, whew, I'm going to write about the inner Justine, you know, like the seven, because when I, when I close my eyes and think of myself, you know, I'm not in my forties, I'm a seven year old girl. <laughs> so this is, I'm very excited about this. And I kind of feel like future work. I feel like this, this Mulan character, the, the character in my third book is the one that I feel I could work with um, for future work. And so my idea is this, little this this child who is kind of like an ancestor in training who you know like just learns about rituals of care it's kind of like a little mini um, I'm gonna say mini babaylan but like you know like a healer in training an ancestor in training and kind of just have that role in her life so that's my that's my inspired um ideas so who knows where that goes check in with me Edgar next time and be like so how's your um progress how's progress going so I don't know I love that way that. I have accountability <laughs> I love that that's that's fantastic uh Justine and would love to kind of reconnect with you on that sometime I think that I've definitely in my kind of my healing process I keep revisiting my ongoing healing process revisiting my um you know my 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 little girl self so I'd love yeah. to process and kind of go on that journey with you so this is that's exciting so exciting. can I just say also okay so I'm going to tell you this because there have been few posts that you've made talking about your Lola that have just like had me bawling like oh. you know the the third book I have is you know the this little girl Mungan and her Lola and how she cares for her Lola and it's like oh my gosh we have so many stories as a as a community about our Lolas right like yeah. everyone that I have kind of been in touch with to collaborate with on this book they all have stories about their Lola and yeah. why don't we tell stories about our Lola well you know? I actually would love to 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 see if we can maybe host a circle and actually kind of connects to the person who has a question in the chat uh, because Jillian, who is actually joining us from Canada, um, her partner is doing this amazing project, uh, really mm -hmm. kind of looking at uh, care kind of from a transnational kind of perspective an intergenerational mm -hmm. one um, and how it's transforming in kind of the Philippine diaspora. And mm -hmm. one of the things we really wanted to start with actually was with our grandmothers and, and mm. a lot of, um, because for those of us who are sort of second generation North Filipino, North American, um, a lot of, many of us have very fond uh, relationships with our grandmothers who, at least in my case, was was brought very explicitly to the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. for the purpose of, of taking care of me and my brother. And um, so the project really is an opportunity for all of us to really pay some real homage to our Lola. So um, yeah, she's definitely been top of mind a lot for me. And I appreciate you um, being so affirming about that. Um, you know, I think that's why actually November just, I just kind of had to, I hibernated for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. She felt very close and I needed to kind of be um, there with her. 
and kind of listen in a little bit on what I think she was trying to tell me. But mm -hmm. I do want to pass it to Jill. Jill has a great um, kind of question here about what's your view on how stories are shared, especially during the pandemic with remote learning and virtual read alouds. Have there been many requests by your publishing uh, um, press to have these stories shared? And then, you know, um, Jill was just talking about the story reading that um, that she does on Sing with Nanai with publisher's permission, but then, you know, sometimes the non-responsiveness. I almost feel like this is like the beginnings of a collab. <laughs> you know, America, let's do this, so exciting. Cause I definitely would love to see more read aloud. So anyhow, answer that for, for Jill. Yes, so, you know, silver linings, the pandemic really, I had, so many more requests for readings and sold as a, I, I'm going to say as a result, so many more books um, because of them, even though I have not made um, marketing efforts because I didn't really have the, the bandwidth and just really quite frankly, the energy and the mental space to do it. Um, but despite that, um, the virtual space really has kind of been a blessing in a way for this kind of outreach. Um, and, you know, like I've been able to do readings, not readings and like talks at, for, for example, University of Texas, which I would never go to, right? If I, if I, if it were not virtual, I'd be like, I can't go. And um, so definitely it's, it's expanded the reach um, because of it. And, um, and, and I hope for more, I hope for more, but I do miss the in-person. I do miss the in-person gatherings um, because there are other activities that go with just the reading. Like the last one that I did with a Tagalog project just before the pandemic happened with, uh, was a reading and then we made Champorado and then we made um, uh, amulets, like the anting anting, like DIY anting anting. And it was just so much fun to have that, which we can't really have virtually. Um, but that's what I miss. So it's kind of, you know, yeah, there's good stuff and bad stuff about it. Yeah, no, um, well, hopefully somehow you guys can connect. I think that would yes. be great if there's a way, right, to kind of extend so much of, of course, of our experiences, um, Filipinos in, you know, the United States are so very similar to, mm -hmm. to uh, Filipino Canadians. So, um, and I know, you know, besides Jill, I think I saw Monica here, which is awesome. So um, that, that would be, it would be exciting if we could try to do something like that. And that's something that I'm hoping to be able to do more of in this kind of school that I've launched. I just, there was always these ambitions of being able to kind of, you know, um, you know, create a platform for mm -hmm. um, this work to be done. And so, um, yeah, I feel like there's more, more space in, in kind of this, this other um, outside of connected to, but also aside and apart from what's happening at the Bulosan Center. Ivy, I do want to say thank you. Thank you, Ivy, for all of the wonderful resources that you shared in the chat. Um, you know, it's really, really great to see all of this stuff um, out there. Of course, also, the link to um, the social justice book fair. You know, a lot of these things, of course, are in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is amazing. It's such a great um, center for this uh, really beautiful work. Um, and hoping that we can kind of foster more of that, those kinds of spaces beyond um, the Bay Area. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, one of the, um, and, you know, there is a new bookstore, at least here in the greater Sacramento region where I live, which is I'm hoping will be a potential site for, um, you know, doing readings of, of um, more Filipino authors, including you, Justine, when we get to, to a place where we can do that kind of work again. Um, and so thank you again for everybody, uh, you know, sharing. We still have a little bit more time if anybody has any, um, yeah, Sacramento Public Library would be absolutely awesome. Um, yeah, Ricardo. Um, it would be great to actually, you know, I, I live in Elk Grove and Elk Grove is quite diverse also. It feels very reminiscent to my own childhood growing up in um, the Bay Area in Union City, uh, kind of East Bay. Um, oh, hey, that's great. And so um, I'd love to be able to see more spaces like that where we can um, bring together parents of color, um, 
uh, children of color to be able to kind of uh, hear about, um, you know, stories that that resonate with our lives. Oh, Ivy, great. And uh, separately, Ivy, you and I have to connect because Ivy, we will be advertising soon through another hat that I wear through the Filipino American educators of California space. Ivy will be doing a, a professional development workshop with us there, but Ivy has a question about what advocacy can we do to ensure that your book and others can get into the libraries. I'm assuming calling them, making, going to their websites and et cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, great question, Ivy. Um, I think one thing I'm hoping we're able to do actually, speaking of which, on the other side of things, in my hat as the president of the Filipino American Educators Association, um, one thing I'd like us to do in that space actually is to make sure to um, go to the California Department um, of Education's website and submit proposal after proposal after proposal of books that get um, listed officially as, uh, you know, books that uh, language arts teachers can and should be using in the classroom. And so oh. I definitely hope that we can lead a campaign that would include uh, Justine's book as well as all of the other books, because I mean, I did a, a search on the California Department of Education's website for what they have as approved readings. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's a very, very, very thin set of, of offerings. So um, thank you for that. I mean, I think that's one thing we could potentially do at the state level, but do other people have suggestions or maybe what's been your experience, uh, Justine? Have you had to just do it on your own, um, getting the book in, in local libraries? Oh yes, and we definitely need to promote librarianship as a career. Um, uh, that's fantastic. We've, I've, I've been mentoring a bunch of people through the Belosan space and encouraging that. And so I think things will shift, um, you know, on the other side, of course, similar to kind of the critiques that Justine had. Sometimes it's just not enough to have BIPOC people in those roles if they don't have that perspective either, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so ensuring that we have more people like us, but also people with the perspective that, you know, um, is more critical becomes really vital, but absolutely. Um, so I guess, yeah, how, how would you answer that question, Justine? Curious to hear. So I, I, had, an, I had another answer, but I'm just going to piggyback on what you said about having more people. I think that if we like think a little more broadly about who is involved in the publishing field, we can actually have more impact if we start thinking of like librarians as part of that or reviewers of books is part of that. Like even readers are part of that, right? Like you go out there and you read this book, write, generate your own buzz, right? Over this book, because if you wait for the mainstream media to do it, they're not gonna do it, right? So this is kind of what I was getting at with the whole engagement of the community in all aspects of the publishing, not just editorial and like the executive, you know, the, the, the more posh, positions right but like all of those matter like in the in the grand scheme of things there are many ways that we can be part of this this um we can there are many ways that we can be part of this whole pie i guess we can say um so the more we have of us doing whatever aspects of it the better and i do like what you said about the librarians because that is also for me like they are allies like they, they really can make or break a child's experience when the child goes to the library and be like, where am I going to find books, right? Like some, even I, an adult, I go in and I'm like, I don't know where to look for these books because it's, it's big and there are many books. And so librarians, I think, hold some key to helping um, our young readers figure out um, how to navigate and what might interest these kids. Sometimes they don't know, but if they see it and they, you know, the characters look like them, then they might be more motivated to do it. Um, anyway, so uh, so that's my thing. And then I, I was, actually, I was also talking to uh, Tracy from, uh, from FIAC um, and getting help in putting together a curriculum for both books, I mean, for, for all three books and kind of figuring out how, how it fits into whichever grade it is that we're gonna try to, to, to introduce it to. Um, I haven't thought about this before, because like I said, it didn't, use, it didn't start out as, a pro, as this big of a project. 
now it has and now I'm, I'm thinking about more people and more ways to collaborate with uh, the, the community and so um, if anybody else has more ideas on how to get this out and I am I am all ears no, thank you so much um you know this kind of um in some ways speaks to the earlier kind of question about you know how do we exist right in the system that um you know uh it's so extractive um it it devalues kind of who we are what we do um and um, I mean, it's still the system in which we live, right? But how mm -hmm. do we do that, live in that space, transform what we can within those spaces and institutions, and yet at the same time, simultaneously grow autonomous ones, right? It's a, yeah. it's a challenge. And I think part of, you know, um, um, I think the answer is that, you know, being able to kind of, it, it may seem like a lot of work, but um, it's also the reality of, I think, what it means to exist in, in this space. Um, and so I think that, you know, whatever we can do on one hand to continue to organize ourselves and work to pushing the California Department of Education um, at that level or to advocating at the local level um, in our school districts uh, to for these kinds of books to get some kind of recognition. And, you know, uh, while we are at the same time, doing that work of kind of creating this alternative curriculum that we, again, are both pushing in those spaces while also trying to disseminate them on our own independently in our community. I think, you know, that that's uh, that's the work. Um, and in some ways, that's what kind of keeps us going, you know, um, and not feeling completely defeated, defleted, uh, de deflated and defeated um, working in the system is being able to kind of um, manifest something um, new, manifest the things that, that we really want in our, in our world and, and for our lives. So um, thank you for, for that again, Justine. And yeah, I'm looking forward to working with you in either capacity around um, getting the book out there in, in more spaces and more hands and um, households and schools, but also, you know, hopefully being able to develop a curriculum um, so that especially it can be kind of taught and used in classrooms. Um, another set of resources here, we should have one of our, if you'll give a book review, that's great. Yeah. Oh, this is awesome. Thank you so much for, for, for these resources, Ivy. I want to make, I'm hoping that we, uh, oops, sorry. I just, I clicked not intending. <laughs> to do that really, because I wanted to go back and make sure to share for the upcoming events. Again, sorry for extending just a little bit past the time uh, that I wanted to allocate for this, but do know that we have a couple, we're going to have regular events, everyone. So I'm really excited that um, we are, we have two events next week. Hold on just a second. I wanna adjust this so it's easier. I had them up, so maybe you saw them earlier, but I'll share them again. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, um, Justine, for being here. These are, oop, it's taking a little while. So two events next week um, for Filipinos. This is always so fun and interesting to learn about the very, very earliest uh, Filipinx settlements in North, at least in the United States and arguably in all of North America. Um, we'll be hearing from uh, Michael uh, Salgarolo, who will talk about St. Malo, Louisiana. And the next day, and this is really exciting also for me personally, just because I grew up with Joanne Rendelia. We went to high school together. We went to college together. We ended up going to grad school together. I love, love, love her work. It's deeply personal um, and also very just amazing uh, research. Um, but she will be talking about colorism in the in the Filipinx community. Um, there will be more, and we have lots of different types of speakers uh, that we're hoping to bring into this space. So, yeah, thank you so much for for joining us, um, and we'll see you again soon. And it, it, for all the fantastic resources, everybody, so so grateful to have all of you on here. Thank you.